Hello, everyone. Welcome to the QSI seminar. Today, we have the great honor to have Martin Plavala from University of Siegen with us. Uh, Martin is an expert on the more mathematical parts of quantum mechanics and quantum information. And today, he will tell us about Jordan products of quantum channels and their compatibility. Uh, thank you very much, Martin, and take it from here. Okay, thanks. So what I will tell you about is uh, the joint work with my collaborators, with Mark Girard and Jamie Sikora. And uh, we actually developed this by first thinking about some channel compatibility stuff and then somehow collected all of our results and written this into a paper. So and there's going to be uh, two types of different results about channel compatibility. And uh, these I want to tell you something about. But first of all, I would like to give some kind of motivation of why is this maybe at least somehow interesting or maybe some little bit practical motivation. So we can start with some example. And this example, I didn't completely invent it, but this, this is actually heavily inspired by something that uh, uh, we need to do in, uh, for some application in uh, machine learning. And uh, it's a very simple calculation. So we have some input data, MIJ, and this is some matrix with uh, uh, in, in this is I and J, and we have some, and we want some out, output PAB. So how do we get the PAB? Well, we can just, we just need to compute it as a function of this C, where C is some bilinear form, so nothing too hard. This is just like vector and matrix multiplication. And these F vectors, they're given as, as a function of this MIJ, where it's summed over uh, elements of some other matrix Y, in, and this L just indexes different Y matrices you can have here. So how do we compute this? Well, I mean, it's classically, it's very simple. Well, you compute the FL, so you carry out this computation, you create a copy of FL, and this is something you usually don't think about in classical computation, but then you compute PAB, but for PAB, you need two copies of FL. So you actually have to create a copy. And I mean, usually you don't think about this in classical computation because you just call the variable twice. But now there's the problem. In quantum theory, you cannot just call a variable twice because once you call a variable, once you do something with it, it's not the same variable anymore. You can only use it once. And uh, for this, it's like a quite interesting exercise in classical uh, programming. Uh, try to program something simple or some application where you call every variable just once. Like after calling a variable, just destroy it. And you will see that this uh, sooner or later becomes quite problematic and quite annoying. But uh, this is what we have to deal with in uh, quantum theory. And this is, the tr this is one of the trade-offs we pay for other uh, speed-ups that we get. So what do we do in quantum algorithm? Well, I mean, we compute FA, but we also compute FB. So we compute this thing twice. And then from those, we can compute PAB. So, uh, okay, this maybe doesn't sound like such a horrible thing because, yeah, okay, I just need to compute something twice. But if you realize that this should be the input data and the out wanted output, this is something like pre processing uh, uh, some uh, data for a machine learning al algorithm. So there's maybe 10, 20,000 of these MIJs, there's maybe 10 uh, to 20,000 of these PABs we want to get. And if you want to compute, if you need to compute something twice, which means that you need to now compute it 20 to 40 times more stuff than in the classical case, right? So this is a bit problematic or can be a bit problematic since maybe we need more anti qubits for this. Maybe we need more, uh, we don't need more circuit depth, but maybe we need more you know, anti qubits, more, I don't know, more connections and among the qubits. So it gets harder and harder. But one nice thing, and one thing that I'll uh, often do is uh, look at things in diagrams. Uh, because we can essentially express this type of calculation as some diagram where the information flows along the diagrams. And this will be actually very useful later on. Because uh, somehow, if you already look at these diagrams, they look something like uh, what you can see if you visualize your, the programs on a quantum computer. So the classical algor algorithm, we took the input data, we passed it through this uh, Y matrix, then this uh, gate here copies the data twice, puts it into C, and gets, gives us the output. The quantum algorithm takes the data twice, and twice applies this Y matrix, 
then applies the C and we get the output. So here we can clearly see that uh, uh, here in the classical approach, we can use the copy gate, but in the quantum approach, there's no copy gate. So we have to just create two, two copies of the input data or we have to initialize uh, the input data two times. And by the way, this is also a thing in quantum computation. You cannot just tell to a quantum computer like, hey, store this variable. You have to initialize it into the registers. So it's, it's, it's even harder the more times you have to do it. So now the question is like, can we do something about this? Can we do something about having to initialize uh, the variable twice and having to perform this Y twice? And uh, yes, there's the simple idea that, hey, maybe if there would be some, some gate uh, or some transformation phi such that uh, these two diagrams would be roughly the same, then we only need one copy of MIJ. So now I, I, I want to be just very intuitive at this uh, point. That's why this just says that diagrams are roughly the same. And I'll specify this uh, later on. But basically, this is the idea that maybe if there's some big channel phi such that we can uh, apply to one copy of MIJ and get two copies of what we of the result we want, then maybe we don't need to initialize MIJ two times and perform this Y two times, but we just uh, implement this phi and we have one copy of the input data and there we go. So this already is something like the motivation for channel compatibility. And the main idea here is that uh, we can see this uh, Y uh, transformations as quantum channels. Now, quantum channels are some generalizations of quantum gates, and uh, it's just some transformation of your quantum system. So, for example, we have also channels in classical uh, computation. You know, we can think of something like NAND and XOR gates and other things, NOT gate, and this can all be seen as classical channels. In quantum theory, we have other gates and we have other channels, but these are just some transformations that, in, that take in a quantum system and output a quantum system. And so this would be the main idea of compatibility that, okay, maybe there are some channels that we want to implement, but we don't, have the, we don't want to deal with having the input twice, we just want to have it one time and get two outputs. And so if something like this holds, we will say that these two channels are compatible. Are there any questions at this point, or is this uh, roughly understandable? Or... Because uh, this is meant to be like very intuitive, and now I, what I'll do is that I will have to introduce some uh, mathematical notation. And with that mathematical notation, I can exactly uh, define what's uh, going on in here. Yeah, so this seems to be kind of related to sample complexity. So when you have some data data in a quantum state or prepared through an oracle, for you know, many computations, you would need multiple copies of the state or you would need to use the, the oracle many times. And you are basically asking that for what are the types of you know, channels where one of the oracle query or one of the copy of a quantum state would be enough to compute some for computing some bilinear functions of that state. Yes, exactly. Except for it doesn't have to be a linear function, it can be any function, but yes, that's the main idea that uh, in these oracle queries we're somehow limited by no broadcasting theorem, but if we take into the account the oracle itself, then maybe we can be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm very happy that uh, this actually worked. <laughs> Good, so now I will introduce some mathematical notation, but uh, I will also, I'll try to explain everything uh, in a physics language, but also everything, I'll try to keep, uh, explain everything to, in a computer science language so that everybody can in principle follow. But if you get lost at any point, or if you forget what some symbol means, please ask, ask me because I know that uh, I think maybe some, something like 40% uh, of people get lost because they just forget what a symbol means, so. Please ask about this anytime. So here it is. So essentially, I want to work with some finite dimensional Hilbert spaces. This will be usually denote x, y, y1, y2, or z. Uh, and I'll be working with linear operators on, from x to y. So these are essentially matrices that map vectors from x to y. And this pulse will be positive semi-definite operators on x. 
in uh, what follows, I will be often working with uh, uh, positive uh, semi-definite matrices. A lot of the problems will include something about positive semi-definiteness, and almost all of the problems I will describe can, can and will be formulated, and in fact, in the paper, are formulated as SDPs. So now, if, if you know what SDPs are, and I think that a lot of computer scientists know, like, like you can just follow just by reading this as a lot of interesting SDPs that somehow happen to be relevant in quantum theory. Okay, so if you had the basic quantum theory, you probably know that we can express uh, quantum states as uh, density matrices, which are just positive operators with trace equal to one. I will also talk about POVMs. Uh, these are something that describe uh, measurements of quantum systems. So it's basically like a tuple of uh, positive operators such that they sum up to identity matrix. And these traces uh, of a state against the elements of the POVM. These are probabilities of observing some outcome I. So this is what we use to describe measurements in quantum theory. If you had maybe only like quantum theory 101 or something like that, then, uh, and you don't know this uh, formula, then you can just somehow imagine this, this MI can be thought of as a projector, you know, something like projection on the uh, end eigenvalue of an operator. And then this would, this trace, you can easily prove that this would just uh, give you uh, the matrix elements of, of rho. So this would just reconstruct the formula, you know, from basic quantum theory. And I mean, since this is about channel compatibility, I'll be talking a lot about channels. So channels are these uh, things that map quantum systems to quantum systems. And uh, so we usually say that they're completely positive and trace preserving maps from operators to operators. Now, this is important to realize that they do not map the Hilbert space to Hilbert space, but they map the operators to operators. So, so these are usually also sometimes also called super operators. They're basically functions that maps matrices to matrices. And they have several important properties. First of all, phi has to be a linear function of matrices. This is because we want somehow our probabilities to preserve. So if you somehow do some convex combination of density matrices and you put that into a channel, then you want to get the same as if you would first put the constituents into the channel and then did convex combination. So there's some operational meaning in why this should be a linear map. This trace preserving just means that uh, if you put uh, x into, uh, into phi, then trace of phi x is the same as trace of x. And this is simply because we want to map quantum states to quantum states. And there's this uh, uh, condition that quantum states must, must have trace normalized to one. And so what we have to do, we have to require the channels are trace preserving. So they map uh, uh, quantum states to matrices which have trace equal to one. So that's why there's this trace preserving. And now there's also this uh, completely positive. And this completely positive uh, is uh, it's a bit tricky because uh, uh, we can first look at this at what positive means. And positive would mean that if you put into a channel a positive matrix, so something from POS X, you would get something from positive uh, matrices on Y. Uh, but this is actually not enough. We have to, uh, because we have to also require that if we have some other system, let's say Z, and we put into, in, and then we can do something like identity times phi, and we can map matrices on x times z to y times z. And this complete positivity just means that if you do this, and if you input, if you use phi to map something like one half of entangled state, what you should still get is a valid quantum state. So this complete positivity just means uh, positive also on tensor products and all of those stuff. But uh, luckily, we will not uh, have to deal with this, like dealing with this complete positivity is very easy because it just boils down to something being positive some definite matrix, right? So this C -H -C -X -Y will denote all channels from X to Y. And one important thing that I will heavily rely on is the Choi isomorphism. Now, the Choi isomorphism is uh, just a mathematical trick or there is some interpretation behind it, but uh, it's, we can mainly see it as a mathematical trick. And it's that if we take a channel phi and we make this type of, uh, we can construct this type of object here. So uh, this ij, this is in a bracket notation. This is something like a, a matrix which has zeros everywhere except for position ij, you know. So what we do here is that we sum over such matrices and we can construct the choice matrix here. 
Now, uh, one can then show that this choice matrix, that if, if I give you this choice matrix, you can uniquely reconstruct the original channel from it. And this is very important because this means that instead of working with channels, which is a super operator which maps matrices to matrices, I can just work with the choice matrix. And this is a matrix and it's easier to work with matrix than to work with a function that maps matrices to matrices. The price I have to pay for it is this tensor product. So this choice matrix is, uh, can, it can be something like very big. For the simplest channels that map qubits to qubits, this is already four by four matrix. So uh, the size grows kind of fast. And there's two important things. The first important thing is that if you would uh, apply something like a partial trace on the second uh, thing, then uh, you can show that, uh, well, we have this trace preserving, so the trace would get inside on this element and it would basically get identity matrix here, so, which means that uh, all choice matrices, they have some uh, partial, there, there is some partial trace identity that holds for them, that if you trace away the second thing, then you just get identity on the first one. And second important property is that all choice matrices are uh, positive semi-definite matrices. And they're exactly positive semi-definite because the channels are completely positive. This is, one can exactly show that, that the positive semi-definiteness of choice matrix is if and only if complete positivity of channels. And so now we can have, a, uh, now, we, now we have a simple tool to work with channels because in, whenever I say that I want to work with some channel, I will immediately skip and start working with its choice matrix because that, this is like very useful, very nice way how to represent channels in terms of positive semi-definite operators. And this, and this is essentially where the, all of the SDPs will come from, because now I will express all of my problems as some problems about uh, positive semi-definite operators. So with that, I can now formally define what channel compatibility means. And it's this. It's, uh, well, you, you can define it in equations or you can define it in diagrams. I somehow prefer the second one because I think it's more readable, but to each their own. So we have two channels, phi one and phi two. Now the important thing is that the input spaces are the same, they coincide, but the output spaces are different, right? And we say that they are compatible if there exists some bigger channel such that the input space is the same as the input space of these two, but the output, output space is a tensor product. Now, this tensor product, it just means that you have two quantum systems, and so we will represent this as two wires, you know, because two systems, two wires. And we say that the two channels, phi1 and phi2, are compatible if these two identities hold. So what does this mean? Well, there's this one new symbol, this uh, ground or this trash. This just means uh, partial trace. You can see it here. This is just some partial trace over one of the systems. Now, partial trace means something like uh, throwing away your system. Now, I know that in, uh, this is not so, in practice, this is not so easy because it's not so easy to just uh, delete the value of a of quantum register. But here, we just imagine that we just throw it away and never never look at it. So th that's this, that's what this partial trace represents. And now basically we say that the two channels are compatible, this phi one and phi two, if there's this bigger channel phi, such that I can reconstruct phi one by tracing away the second leg and I can reconstruct phi two by tracing away the first leg. So this essentially means that if I want to get something like uh, the result of uh, phi one acting on some input state that would come here, and I would want to get the result of phi two acting on some input state that would come here, I don't have to uh, do these things separately. I can just apply this big phi and I can just apply the one input state here. I don't need two, I just need one. And I get the one result here and I get the second result here. The caveat is that the overall all state here can be in some sense, it can be somehow entangled and it uh, often will be. And so, uh, you have to somehow think of this that, okay, if you work with this separately and work with this separately, then it gives you the correct uh, predictions of measurements and everything. But if you would somehow want to have these two wires now interact, it's uh, that there can be a slight uh, caveat with this entanglement here. Good. And so now the one result that, uh, or now I'll, 
I'll show you like how to translate this into something about positive sum definite matrices because I said here that we can represent every channel as a choice matrix. And so now I want, instead of dealing with these type of equations that, that say something about super operators, I want to express this as choice matrices and something about choice matrices because uh, then I can just uh, put, it, put this into a computer and have my computer solve the problem for me. Well, up to certain dimension. And this is a known result. And uh, it says that if you have two channels, phi1 and phi2, they are compatible if and only if these two equations hold. I mean, the first thing is that you can now easily see that these two equations somehow look very similar to these two equations. They're just a little bit different. And so what do they say? Well, they say that the choice matrix of phi1 has to be some partial trace of this bigger choice matrix. And the choice matrix of phi2 has to be just some partial trace of this bigger choice matrix. Now, if you have had quantum information theory, you probably know what partial trace is, but uh, uh, if you are maybe like a computer scientist and you're not sure, you can just treat this partial trace as some uh, map from matrices to matrices, as some linear function on matrices. So it's just something which you can compute on the computer. And you can exactly see that this partial trace corresponds to this thing here, and this partial trace corresponds to this thing here, and it's it's easy to derive that if uh, the channels are compatible, then this hold and going the other way is not uh, not too hard. It's uh, quite possible. You just need to know how to reconstruct the channel from the tray matrix. So this is the channel compatibility, and this is what I'll be now mostly talking about. Are are there any questions or maybe comments or? Okay. If it's clear, then I can actually, uh, actually, there's one interesting thing, and maybe you also realize this, that this problem uh, looks oddly similar to other problems in quantum theory. And we often uh, see something like this in quantum theory. And we often see it because uh, there's a bigger problem, or there's a probably more known problem, which is the quantum marginal problem, which is exactly that. So quantum marginal problem is a similar problem. And it says that we have uh, state row one, which is on two Hilbert spaces, and we have state row two, which is on two Hilbert spaces. So row one is this uh, blue thing, and row two is this red thing. And the fact that there's, they're on two Hilbert spaces, you can see that the Hilbert space is the black dot, and they somehow are a state between those two. And we say that the, ch ch uh, that the states are compatible if there is a big state, row, such that uh, the two states are partial traces. So what does this mean now? Well, the two states, row one and row two, are compatible if there's this big state, somehow that you can reconstruct row one and row two by just throwing away, like if you throw away this system from row, then uh, you get row one, and if you throw away this system from uh, row, you get row two, right? So this is called uh, state compatibility problem or quantum marginal problem, and one often uh, uh, finds this in quantum theory. Uh, and it sometimes often, or it relatively often comes up uh, in different applications. And note that there is this uh, one condition that uh, if you want the states to be compatible, like uh, if you have row one and you th throw away this thing, and if you have row two and you throw away this thing, you must get the same thing because it's just somehow the reduced state here must be the same. So it's just this equation. Now, why I said this is similar to the previous problem, or because here we have some uh, big state and a trace, and here we have big state and a trace, and the same thing we had here, like a big state and a trace, and a big state and a trace. So it uh, it's obvious that uh, compatibility of channels is a subset of uh, quantum marginal problem, and I say a subset because we have uh, here these are choice matrices, and as I said before, there is some. Uh, uh, there, there is some partial trace uh, thing that must hold for all choice matrices, but this does not have to hold for all channels. So now I can finally arrive to the first result that we proved. And the first result that we proved is essentially that uh, you can also go the other way. And given a uh, given, uh, quantum marginal problem for two states, you can transform it to, to compatibility problem for two channels. And that there's some, some isomorphism and we do it basically this way. So we basically take uh, any two states for which you want to consider the, 
uh, quantum marginal problem. And what, what you can do is that you can apply these uh, uh, more Penrose inverses around here. Uh, now, this sigma, it's just some, uh, it's just the one overlapping uh, partial trace of uh, those two states. So when I said here that we should have some partial traces which are the same, basically if you have row one and you discard this, what you get here should be a sigma. And if you discard this from row two, you should get the same sigma. Well, this is that sigma. And if, if you apply it uh, as more Penrose uh, inverses like this around the states, you can basically show that uh, the states row one and row two are compatible if and only if this row one prime and row two prime are compatible. And moreover, you can show that this row one prime and row two prime, that they're joint matrices of some channels. So what we can do now is that uh, if you give me a quantum marginal problem and you tell me, tell me like, uh, hey, solve this, I can just use these formulas. I can compute something and I can reduce it to a, to a problem of compatibility of channels. So this means, this shows that basically uh, channel compatibility problems and quantum marginal problems are in one-to-one. -one. And uh, this is, okay, this might seem at first like, why is this interesting? It's just a uh, problem is a problem. But uh, this is interesting because uh, now any result I derive for uh, ch channel compatibility, I can apply to quantum marginal problem by just using this trick. And uh, in some sense, it's easier to derive uh, tricks for channel compatibility because you can see them as matrices, but you can also see them as channels. And sometimes it's a bit easier to argue about channels because it's a bit more operational. So this is a useful trick uh, for transforming a quantum marginal problem to channel compatibility. Okay. Now, uh, what I'm say when I'm speaking about compatibility, or so this is basically the result one, that uh, the two problems are equivalent. Now, when I'm speaking about compatibility, there's also other objects that we usually think about compatibility of in quantum theory. And uh, maybe you also heard this, there's uh, these POVMs and their compatibility. So, uh, or this is also called joint measurability of, or joint measurability of POVMs. Yes. So the main idea, Sorry, Martin, can I have a question about the, the channel compatibility? Yes. Yeah, so your result shows that they are, they are equivalent in some sense. And does it mean that also determining whether they are, comp so uh, compatibility of states is a common computational task. Um, is, there, uh, uh, is your result also saying that if you can compute the compatibility of states with some complexity or, you know, with some, type of an algorithm, you can use the same algorithm to determine compatibility of channels? Uh, yes. Okay. This way, yes, because uh, every channel compatibility is just a quantum marginal problem for the choice matrices. So this way it holds. The other way, we haven't uh, looked at this uh, from the complexity perspective, so we don't know whether because there is this known result that uh, quantum marginal problem is QMA complete, if I'm yeah. not wrong. Yeah. So we we don't we're not we didn't exactly show that also channel compatibility is QMA complete, but uh, one can probably take this isomorphism and try to look at it whether somehow whether it's sufficient or whether one can get something interesting out of this. Yeah. No, yeah, that looks like a fairly, you know, something that would be a fairly simple corollary to your result. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, but uh, unfortunately, I'm not a complexity person, so I, yeah, I, I'm always afraid of saying anything about complexities. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Good. So we have this equivalence, and now to POVMs. So there's this problem of joint measurability of POVMs, which. Uh, I mean, this is something like a very basic problem in quantum theory because this is some generalization of Heisenberg uncertainty and all of those uh, things about non-commuting operators that you must have heard at uh, quantum 101. So uh, given two, two different POVMs, uh, we say that these two represent something like uh, two different measurements. And, but now, I mean, I want to know the results of both of the measurements, not only one. And so, I say that they are compatible or jointly measurable if there's some bigger measurement, uh, bigger POVM, PIJ, that now has two indices, 
such that if I sum over j, I get mi, and if I sum over i, I get nj. So this is like a visual representation for, for mi having three elements and nj having four elements, and then this p has 12 elements, and if you sum the uh, rows, you get m, if you sum the columns, you get n. So this is some, I said that this is some uh, generalization of uh, commutativity of operators because you can say that you can somehow see that uh, with all of these operators that you have at quantum 101, what you're essentially doing are so-called projective measurements. So you replace this P of EMs by some projections on the eigenvalues of some operator and you replace this with projections of uh, eigenvalues of other operator. And these are valid P of EMs. This is rather easy to show. And then you can show that uh, somehow they're compatible. Uh, like if, if they're compatible, then you can measure them at the same time. But for projective measurements, you can show that they are compatible if and only if they commute. And this somehow transforms into the commutativity of the original operators. So that's the story how to get from operators to joint measurability. But uh, please note that if these two are proper P of EMs, so they're not, project they not projectors because they don't have to be projectors. They can be many different things. If they are not projectors, this is way general than uh, commutativity of the two P of EMs. Also, one nice thing to observe here is that essentially uh, the idea is that we, we want to we want output of two things. We want output of two measurements, but we want to perform only one measurement. So in this sense, it's already similar to the uh, ch channel compatibility problem that we want two outputs for the price of one input. And also these equations, they look similar to all of those partial trace equations that I showed earlier because, okay, this is not partial trace. This is just some kind of sum, but uh, partial trace is in some sense also some very uh, high tech sum. So, so this already looks similar and then maybe some, someone can say like, okay, maybe we can uh, encode one thing as uh, the other as well. And well, yes, we can. And so what we can do is that we can take two POVMs, MI and NJ, and we can construct this, what we call measurement channels. So this is basically a channel which uh, takes X and computes these probabilities, uh, which we usually want to compute when we have a POVM, and puts them on a diagonal of a density matrix. This II, this is in a bracket notation. These are just the diagonal elements of matrix. And the same for phi N. We can also construct this measurement channel, which just computes the probabilities and puts them on the diagonal. It's uh, very easy to show that these two things actually are channels. You can easily see that they are trace preserving because if you trace away this projector, you just get sum over these elements, but now this is a POVM, so this sum up, sums to one and you just get trace X. And you can also show that uh, this is completely positive. It's uh, it's not so straightforward, but uh, it's somehow well known that these channels are, are a special type of entanglement breaking channel and all entanglement breaking channels are positive. So these are valid channels. And moreover, there's very nice results that uh, the two POVMs are compatible if and only if the two measurements channels are compatible. So this is a really nice result because now if I want to work, if I want to deal with this kind of scenarios of uh, measurement compatibility or POVM compatibility, what I need to do is that I need to write down these uh, measurement channels and I just need to look at their compatibility. And so I can, so any result now I derive for channel compatibility also hold for POVM compatibility with these types of measurement channels. So this is essentially good because I, I have just showed, because now I don't need to derive many different results. I can just work with on channel compatibility. And if you, if you want to know something about POVM compatibility, well, use measurement channels and uh, export my results there. And as I argued before, if you want to know something about the uh, quantum marginal problem, use the trick from before. And so, but we can also generalize this measurement channels because as you can see here, these projectors, they're something like pure states. So I can say like, okay, we can maybe construct these measure and prepare channels, which are essentially all entanglement breaking channels where we replace this pure state by any density matrix. And we can also put any density matrix here. And now we can also look at the uh, compatibility of these channels. This is also rather interesting because uh, this channel somehow expresses that you measure uh, the P of M, M and then you get the result exactly. While here we can also see this adding of some general trimatrix as set as adding some kind of uh, 
uh, noise to the output of the POVM or something along those lines. So that's one way to see these measurement prepared channels, but they're also a nice general generalization of these measurement channels. And we can also now ask something about the compatibility of uh, these guys. And uh, now this is the second result. And the second result is this, that there exists a pair of uh, measurement prepared channels set with no measurement prepare compatibilizer. So what does this mean? That means that I can find uh, two channels of this form, psi m and psi n, such that they are compatible as channels, so, so such that uh, uh, all of this holds, but such that uh, the joint uh, channel, the compatibilizer, the big thing, the big phi with the two lines on the right side is not of this form. This is rather in interesting result because uh, it somehow shows that uh, like, for example, for these two channels, you can easily show that uh, if the POVMs MI and NJ are compatible, then uh, somehow then these two channels will be compatible automatically. This is easy result to show. But uh, the result too of our paper some shows that uh, the other way it doesn't hold. You can have two measurement channels, MI and NJ, such that they are compatible, but these two uh, POVMs, they are never compatible because we can show that if they would be compatible, there would be some uh, measure and prepare uh, compatibilizer. There would be some measure and prepare this big channel with the uh, two legs on the right. But this is not the case. So in some sense, this shows that uh, compatibility of POVMs is a weaker notion than the compatibility of channels because we can have a situations where uh, we use uh, POVMs uh, to construct some channels. The channels are compatible, but the POVMs are not compatible. So this is the second of the results that say something about uh, these hierarchies of compatibility. And now I will go to the Jordan product. So maybe if you have some questions about this. OK. Uh, so now I'll go to the Jordan products. Now, uh, and the Jordan products are a way to solve the compatibility problem. They, they're not a way that would always work. So it's not like a solution that would always give you the correct answer or, well, in some sense. But, uh, uh, you know, there's this uh, thing that uh, it's a good try. Because uh, uh, when I was studying physics, when I was doing my bachelor and master, uh, we usually had this uh, lectures on theoretical physics when they always said to us that uh, if, you, if you arrive to a differential equation, for example, like a wave equation, then the uh, first thing that you should do is that you should try to guess the answer. And if you cannot guess the answer, like go and ask mathematicians how to solve this. But if you can guess the answer, guess the answer. And Jordan products are going to be a very uh, useful guess on how to solve the uh, channel compatibility problem. And the inspiration comes from uh, the inspiration comes from POVM compatibility. Because in POVM compatibility, this Jordan product is a well-known trick. It's basically this uh, circle with the dot there, and it's just this type of expression, one half MINJ plus NJMI. And why is this such a good guess? It's because if you sum over J, what happens here is that this sum gives you identity and this sum gives you identity. So you get something like MI plus MI, one half, so you get MI. If you sum over I, you get identity here, identity here. These two things sum together, one half, and you get NJ. So the Jordan product always has the correct marginals because in some sense we can see these sums as taking some marginals. And, but the, the thing is that it doesn't have, this doesn't have to be positive semi-definite operator. It can have negative eigenvalues. But if all of these are positive semi-definite operators, then these two POVMs are compatible. Now, solving POVM compatibility, is this, as we saw, is the same as solving channel compatibility, and that's the same as solving some quantum marginal problem. So this is essentially something like big SDP, and you have to take into account that uh, somewhere along the line, you start working with choice matrices where there's this tensor product so the dimension of the matrix grows uh, uh, like it's basically squared and this this just means that you need to do a lot of matrix products and check uh, whether they're positive some of thing so this is way more computationally efficient if you want to check something very fast 
but it doesn't have to give you the correct answer. But there is a known result, and it's basically that you have one uh, projection valid measure. So if all of these are projectors, projection operators, then uh, the two POVMs are compatible if and only if uh, uh, this is positive semi definite. Okay, this is nice and all, but uh, now I want to solve channel compatibility. And now, now I will basically show you how to generalize this to uh, compatibility of channels. So basically, whenever you will need to solve some channel compatibility, you will know the first guess to try. And it's this. Okay, so this is some very big, or not very big, but this is some relatively big formula, but uh, we can see here two things. First of all, there's this J, and you can essentially show that this is something like a Troy matrix of a super operator, but it doesn't have to be positive semi-definite. So the super operator doesn't have to be completely positive. Uh, and then it depends on this phi one and phi two, and it depends that we apply them here and here. The nice insight is that it depends uh, linearly on this phi one and phi two, so we would put some linear combination here, and if we would put some linear combination here, it would just uh, uh, fall out of the sum. So this is what we call the Jordan product of channels. And we can have this uh, nice property that the marginals are correct. So if you trace away the second uh, system, and now we have to be a little bit careful because now we have uh, first, second, and third system. You know, there's like uh, two tensor products. There's like also this and these two. So this second means the second inside the brackets. So if you would uh, trace away this one, this gives you something like delta chi. Uh, chi j, so you get something like j here, and here you get something from this, you get something like i here. So you can see that if you trace away the last thing, you get uh, the first Troy matrix, and if you trace away the first thing in the bracket, you get the second Troy matrix. In other words, the Jordan product always has the correct marginals, and if it is positive semi definite, then the two channels are compatible. So it's, it's like a good guess. And so now if you maybe, if somebody comes to your office and says, okay, hey, hey, solve me this uh, channel compatibility problem or, or solve me this quantum marginal problem. Well, before you write down the SDP, you can always check this and maybe it works. And actually it doesn't work in, it uh, actually works in quite a good amount of cases. I'll show you later. But now there's uh, one thing I should comment on that, uh, Okay, I, did, I before introduced something like Jordan product of POBMs, and I also said you can encode POBMs as channels. And uh, if you would uh, put those measurement channels into this definition, you would somehow show that you would get a measurement channel for the Jordan product of the POBMs. So this thing is also consistent with uh, the, the typical uh, good guess for POBMs. And uh, now for the rest of the talk, I'll just uh, comment a little bit more on uh, what one can do with these guesses and how to generalize this guess and some results about that. So please, uh, if you're trying to follow and you have any questions about uh, this and about guessing the solution of the problem, please ask. Okay, so let's go further. Now one can prove some uh, very nice result about the Jordan product of channels, which basically uh, in some sense, copy the previous results of uh, uh, of uh, Jordan product of POVMs. First of all, we can show that if we have uh, this type of measurement channel for any uh, projection valid measure, so this is what we saw before that uh, you trace here with the with the projection and you prepare this uh, ortho uh, this diagonal states. Then we can show that we did show that uh, this is compatible with any other channel phi if and only if the Jordan product is completely positive. So if and only if uh, this matrix is positive. And this just uh, generalizes the result about uh, uh, we had about projection valued measures and Jordan products on, and POVMs. There's also two more easy results. First one is that uh, compatibility with unitary channels, that if your channel is unitary, which basically means that you sandwich a matrix with unitaries, then it's compatible with any other channel if and only if their Jordan product uh, is positive semi-definite. And there's also similar about, about about constant channel. So constant channel is just this thing where you trace away your input and you just replace it with a fixed thing. And this is also uh, compatible with any other channel if and only if the Jordan product is positive semi-definite. 
these two other results are a bit less interesting because matter of fact they are in some sense trivial because one can easily show that this constant channel is compatible with any other channel. So now Jordan product is uh, only a good way to construct the joint channel, but one can also do this by hand. So the second one is not as interesting. This first one is this first one is also a little bit trivial because uh, we know that unitary channels are compatible only with constant channels. One can actually show this from monotonicity of entanglement because you can uh, from this you can somehow show that the Choi matrix is a pure quantum state. So one can get a lot of uh, result from a lot of results from that. And so we essentially know that unitary channels are compatible only with constant channels, and so uh this result also just gives you somehow like trivial prediction but this result free is non-trivial because it lifts the result from pobms to uh measurement channels and to the, their compatibility with any other channel and now to generalize this so uh okay we, we can we could have stopped here and did nothing else but uh, we decided also to generalize this to produce more good guesses because I mean at some point uh, uh, having one good guess is nice but may ha having maybe something like 10 or 20 good guesses is even better because then you have more and more things to try before actually solving the problem and as you will see essentially we think that we have came up with so many good guesses that you can always uh, guess the answer but you have to guess for a very long time so uh, the insight here is that uh, this Jordan product of channels, it can be written in this type of way. This is the identity super operator, this is the first channel, and this is the second channel acting on something. Now, this comes from here, when I, when, because you can here observe that this phi one is always uh, acting on the second uh, tensor uh, thing, and this phi two is always acting on the, on the third tensor thing. So we can just pull this out, and we can have inside some matrix, and if you just do this, you get this type of uh, operator or this type of matrix. This is nice and all, but now, uh, now we have to look, now we should look like may maybe the interesting properties of the Jordan products are somehow encoded in this matrix because it's like the only non-trivial thing there. And that's essentially true because what you can now see that if you trace uh, the second uh, tensor product from this AJP, so if you trace the first uh, thing from the from inside the bracket, you get this type of thing. And if you trace the third thing, you, uh, so if you trace away these things, you also get this type of thing. And this is actually very interesting because this is the thing that we use to construct uh, Choi matrices, right? Because Choi matrix of a channel is that is that just you put the channel over here. And so from this property of the matrix, you can show that the, the marginals are correct. But you can show that the marginals are correct just using this equation. You don't even have to know what AJP is. And so now this is where the generalization comes from because it's like, okay, so obviously we can always construct this with any types of type of matrix here. And uh, the only thing to get these kind of properties that we want is this equation and we don't need this. So that's what we're going to do. We can say that, uh, we can define the generalized Jordan product of uh, channels as something like this, which is just the channels applied to some matrix I, such that the matrix I has this kind of uh, property where if you trace the second or first thing away, you always get this thing that's uh, used to define the choice matrix of the channel. And first, from these two properties, it's a short exercise to show that uh, these uh, marginals are correct. So for whatever A you take, this is always a good guess for uh, for the joint channel for for the big channel, and this is always a good check, good guess to solve uh, the channel compatibility problem. And now now we might be like a uh, little bit confused because the, like I said, like there's one Jordan product, and I have generalized it to all Jordan product. But this is uh, like for example for the, and I find it that there's like a nice example for POVMs. This is not the most general example, but uh, this is one choice that you can make. And basically what you can do for POVMs is that you can uh, take a channel Y such that the, it has trace equal to zero. And then you can, what you can basically do is that you can use this Y to define some general uh, matrix A of this form that satisfies these properties. 
you can uh, compute this type of object for, for measurement channels corresponding to two POVMs. And in this way, you also get generalized the journal product of POVMs. And it's of this form. And now we can see like what's going on here is that if you would trace away i, then you would get here something like trace y, and trace y is equal to zero. So this, this term kills itself in the trace, and you are only left with the sum over this, and we already know that this is a standard Jordan product which gives us the correct marginals. Now, this is not the most general thing you can get for POVMs, but I find it as a nice example of uh, what's actually going on here. And in fact, these type of generalizations of Jordan product of POVMs were not, or at least to my best knowledge, were not known before. And what we did is that we generalized the Jordan product of channels, and from that we got the generalization for POVMs. So this is what I said, that now I only need to work with channels, and anything I do for channels, I can do for POVMs or quantum marginal problem as well. Okay. And uh, now, there's one obvious result, and that two channels are compatible if there's some A satisfying these two conditions, such that the Jordan product is positive semi definite. And uh, now we can get uh, way more results from this because uh, uh, we were now trying to think that, okay, like, does this also mean that for every compatible channel there is some valid A? Because, you know, it's like, maybe there is enough A's to cover all channels, and we actually didn't uh, manage to do this, but we said like, okay, let's uh, call this something. And let's say that the channels are not only compatible, but let's call this special type of compatibility the Jordan compatibility. So we say that the two, two channels are Jordan compatible if there is some A such that this is positive some definite. Every two, every two Jordan compatible channel, channels are compatible, and now the question is, does it also hold the other way? Are any two compatible channels Jordan compatible? Well, we don't really know yet, but we know that if the two channels are inv invertible as linear maps, this is a little bit tricky because this only means that these two channels, because you can see the channels are super operators, and the super operators uh, can be invertible linear maps between vector spaces of matrices, but uh, the inverses do not have to be positive. So if these two channels are invertible as linear maps, then they're compatible if and only if they're Jordan compatible. You know, so. So for, for, these two type, for this special type of channel, we can get uh, that uh, basically this Jordan compatibility is equivalent to compatibility. But now if you think about this, uh, if you think about the super operators as matrices on vector spaces of uh, smaller matrices, because we can always say that, uh, ma uh, that the vector space of matrices is uh, like a Hilbert Schmidt uh, uh, space, and we can always, and the super operators on this are essentially just matrices on this vector space of matrix. So it's something like matrix exception at this point. But uh, basically, if you think about these two channels are invertible matrices, or if you think about when two matrices are invertible, then it's easy to realize and it's well known that almost all matrices are invertible. And so from this one can get that the set of uh, Jordan compatible channels uh, in uh, channels that map the same the Hilbert space to itself has small full measure as a subset of compatible pairs. In other words, this means that uh, uh, the Jordan that almost all compatible channels are Jordan compatible, and if you would randomly sample two compatible channels, then with uh, probability of one, they're Jordan compatible as well. And there's this open question now, like it still stands whether all compatible channels are Jordan compatible, and currently we don't know. And so this is now, now to other results and now actually to SDPs, because there's another nice thing that one can do with this. And this is a thing that uh, I have uh, uh, not yet, uh, that we have not yet exploited in any way. And basically is that, uh, as I said, uh, you can formulate uh, the compatibility of channels as an SDP, but you probably knows this because you can formulate a quantum marginal problem as an SDP. But now the interesting thing is that you can essentially rewrite the SDP for compatibility of the channels in terms of the Jordan product. So somehow, and this is some, somehow something interesting that we didn't yet exploit in any way because we didn't so far had any insight how to exploit this. 
but uh, any but the, basically the SDP for channel compatibility and for quantum margin problem can be just written in terms of the uh, Jordan product. And it doesn't even matter which uh, viable matrix A you choose, this holds for any of them. Moreover, the Jordan compatibility, the question whether there exists some matrix A such that this is positive semi-definite, can be also expressed as SDP. So if you're interested in this and you want to solve something with this, you can just take these SDPs, uh, code them in CVX or whatever solver you have, and you can just solve these problems. And finally, just some examples. So we also did some numerical tests because to just get at least some insight. And the first channel was this type of channel. It's basically a convex combination of identity uh, measurement channel. So this is just a channel that measures in the projective basis and the channel that throws away X and prepares complete mixture. And there's uh, two, two important things here. The first one is that, that for any P and Q above this uh, bottom black line, the channels are compatible. And for any P and Q above this red line, the channels are uh, standard Jordan self com standard Jordan com compatible. So now I'm talking about compatibility of this channel with itself because uh, somehow for channels, this is also non-trivial whether the channel is compatible with itself. And when I say the standard Jordan compatible, I mean Jordan compatible using this uh, uh, standard AJP. So this uh, first good guess. So we can see that uh, these two lines are fairly close and uh, a lot of the channels that are, a lot of the cases where the channel is self-compatible, it's also uh, standard Jordan self-compatible. The second thing one can look at is a simpler channel and this omega Q, which is basically a convex combination of identity and uh, uh, a constant channel. And now we can have two channels with uh, uh, parameters Q0 and Q1. And we can ask about the compatibility of omega Q0 and omega Q1. And we get similar result. We get that this black line, the, everything above the black line, so everything here, is the set where the two channels are compatible and everything above the red line is where the channels are compatible with the standard Jordan product. So with the one, with the first one, the first guess. And we can see that somehow it is known that here for the value of uh, Q0 equal to Q1 equal to one third, the two channels are compatible because this is something like uh, noisy broadcasting, which is uh, which was a problem solving quantum theory maybe 30 years ago. And so we somehow know that everything uh, above this uh, blue line was previously uh, was somehow trivially known to be compatible. And we, we see that this Jordan product criterion gives us some uh, non-trivial guesses here around uh, where the Q0 and Q1, uh, where one of the parameters is small enough. Yeah. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. And if you have uh, questions or comments or anything, please ask. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh, maybe I can ask the first question. Uh, so you, sh yeah. So you motivated the Jordan product, Jordan product as a good guess that works in many cases, but in some cases it doesn't work, and you might have to use the the more general version. Could you give a simple example where general pro Jordan product wouldn't work? So those were exactly the things between the black and uh, red lines. Oh, so okay. if, you, if you go somewhere very close to the edge of compatibility, then it usually doesn't work mm -hmm. in these cases. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned, you know, the one of the results was the equivalence between the channels and states, right? Um, yes. So in your numerical simulation, did you look at which corresponding states are uh, within that newly discovered region, uh, the non like non-trivial to generate the channels, rather than looking at the channels, maybe like say, for example, which graph states lie in those trivial regions versus the newly discovered region? Is that something? Um, no, no. Because actually, uh, I, I came from a more of a channel background, so mm. uh, that's that's I, my intuition when I look at this. I think what sort of states fit those descriptions? Because I don't work with channels, so yeah. uh, I don't know. But honestly, this is not 
very hard to do. So if you get me like a set of channels, then I can maybe in a few hours produce uh, something like MATLAB code that gives you the answer. Mm. Because essentially we, everything we, all of these numerical simulations were carried out in terms of uh, uh, choice matrices of the channels. So, uh, so I think the code is even accessible on, you know, on GitHub if you are interested in it. And so it's very easy to generalize to channels, uh, to quantum marginal problem of states. The only problem that one would have to, the only actual problem that would have time would be to code this kind of transformation with the more Penrose inverses. But I think that's like probably MATLAB or something can do this easily. Okay. Um, maybe you could send the GitHub and I'll have a look. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I saw the, the GitHub. Yeah. Anyway, that was all. Yeah. Uh, actually, in I think it's referenced somewhere in the published version of the paper in okay. something like uh, code availability or whatever. And also, like, okay. feel free to write me an email and yeah, yeah. if you're interested in this. And, okay. Yeah. Thank you. Martin, I could I could ask a question if, if no. No one else is um, interrupting. Um, so I, I'm thinking about applications uh, in particular, like uh, like tomography, like channel tomography or or channel identification. Um, have you? Is this something that you've thought about? Um, it does. Does compatibility give you any insights into into channel discrimination or or identification? And if so, do your results provide some, some new insights on that? Uh, that's a very good question. And I don't know. Because on one hand, if the channel is something like self-compatible, so we can, for the price of one input, you can get two outputs, then this somehow can make you, can somehow help you to perform the tomography. But I, but then also in tomography, you're working with channels and you don't know what they are. So uh, I, I don't know how to, I wouldn't know how to replace them with the compatible versions of, of themselves. But actually, uh, there is one different result. There, there is one uh, result by uh, Teiko Hernosari, Claudio Carmeli, and Alessandro Toigo, where they show that if you have uh, something like uh, incompatible channels, and you are doing some state tomography, which is, I mean, via Choya Miyakovsky isomorphism has some connection to channel tomography, or at least mathematically, then uh, compatibility or incompatibility of the channels can somehow give you some advantage in solving this. So what, what they do is that they use this to construct incompatibility witness. So they say that the two channels are incompatible if, uh, if you have some uh, disadvantage in the game uh, that they are playing with the uh, state discrimination, but I never actually thought whether this also goes the other way and whether you can apply this to channel channel tomography. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it's um, food for thought. I, the, the, the recent things that people have been thinking about is more the idea that you know we're never going to be able to do tomography on a completely unknown channel. There's, the matrix is too big already for four or five qubits, right? So, um, what, but what about if you had like these special examples, like the, the examples that you showed, like what if you knew it was from that class of channels? Um, then, you know, then the problem's easier. You only have to estimate a few parameters. In that scenario, does knowing about various compatibility results reduce the complexity of the problem? Or these are the sort of the things that I can imagine you might be able to answer. Uh, actually, I think by the extent of this uh, incompatibility witness result, it should be maybe possible, or I would expect it should be possible to tell whether like, for example, whether the channel is above the line or below the line or something like that. Right. So okay. you, can, you can maybe estimate that uh, can somehow prove that the channel is self-compatible. So we can say, okay, now, now my parameter space is only this and it's definitely not down here. So maybe something along those lines could be possible. Cool, thanks.
All right. So if we don't have any more questions, let's thank Martin again for this very clear and very accessible talk. Um, and uh, the video will be also available on our YouTube channel. And we will try to add the link uh, to Martin's paper and also to the code-based code description. So thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, everyone. And thanks for all the good questions. And, uh, and thanks for inviting me as well and for the great organization and everything. Okay. Bye.